So hello, everyone. Welcome to this episode of In the Workplace. My name is Wei Ting Tao, and I'm the research editor at the Institute for Public Relations Organizational Communication Research Center. Today, I have the great pleasure to invite Dr. Jiang Hua to share her insights on a frequently discussed topic among organizational leaders and employee, that is employee work-life balance. So just a little bit introduction of Dr. Jiang Hua. She's the Associate Dean of Academic Affairs and Associate Professor of Public Relations at Syracuse University's Newhouse School of Public Communications. And Dr. Jiang's primary research interests include employee communication, social media engagement, corporate social responsibility and advocacy, reputational management, and mental health research and campaigns. She has published more than 50 peer-reviewed journal articles and book chapters, specifically on the topic of employee work-life balance. Dr. Zhang has published more than seven high-impact scholarly articles. So welcome to our conversation today, Dr. Zhang. And um, based on your years of work, what is work-life balance? How do you define it? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Waiting, um, for inviting me to join the conversation. I really appreciate the opportunity to um, share my uh, research and my experience. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, I think it is a very important concept, and I do believe people have their own definitions, mostly you know, experiences-based. Uh, in my own research, I define it in this way. Uh, Work-life conflict actually refers to a particular type of inter-role conflict, which generally represents um, incompatibility, um, you know, between um, performing certain prescriptions of one role and carrying out those of another role. Um, prior research has focused on the conflict between work and family life. However, as everybody knows, employees without traditional families, they all experience similar conflict. Uh, therefore, um, I would like to define work-life conflict um, as this way, based on prior research. Uh, it includes the conflict between work and personal life, focusing on the experiences of employees in integrating their job responsibilities and activities outside their work. So such as family, their leisure time, community services, um, and based on, again, based on prior literature, I define work-life conflict um, in three different forms, time-based, strain-based, and behavior-based. So first of all, time-based work-life conflict refers to the situation where time demanded by work duties prevents an individual, while in our studies, right, an employee from uh, fulfilling non-work responsibilities, um, employees' work schedules or job deadlines may prevent them from attending a very important family reunion, for instance. A scheduled business meeting may interfere with a child's school event. Um, so strain-based work-life conflict has a lot to do with circumstances under which employees who are psychologically preoccupied with work um, you know, fail to honor non-work commitments. I don't know about you guys. Sometimes I feel my, you know, I actually can be preoccupied with my work. Why I am supposed to spend the time with my family? So it is real um, strain-based conflict. Um, and lastly, um, uh, behavior-based work-life conflict. Uh, it arises when employees are expected to enact certain roles at work that are inappropriate in personal life. So for instance, um, previous research suggests that um, managerial roles uh, are often characterized by you know, um, independence, aggressiveness, um, impersonality, logic, you know, ambition, authority, uh, the list can go on. On the other hand, uh, one spouse and children may expect the person, right, the leader, the manager to be very nurturing, uh, very sensitive, warm, accommodating, dependent. Um, so conflict could occur when employees bring home their work behaviors. So I think we all have experiences like that, as I said, based on previous research and our own you know, life experiences. And I think there are three major types of work-life conflict, time-based, stream-based, and behavior-based. 
Oh, that's very insightful thoughts. And um, so as you may indicate it, that employee work-life balance or conflict has been a very long studied concept in PR and organization science research. So from your perspective, why is this topic so important? Mm -hmm. uh, specifically, what are some of the important benefits of employee work-life balance for both the employee themselves and for the organizations? Yeah, that's an, another great question. And I think we often think about that, right? Because it's about employees' well-being uh, and humans want to be happy. And we don't want to uh, experience a high level of conflict between work and our long work. Um, we all care about that, I think. Um, and um, organizations these days are expected to and should care deeply about the well-being of their employees. Um, so on the personal side, work-life conflict can lead to, for instance, um, life dis dissatisfaction, anxiety, depression, you know, uh, not very good health complex we may have in our personal lives, right? And the list goes on and on. On the other hand, there are consequences of high work-life work conflict on organizations. And I believe, for instance, um, work disruptions, right? And work can get disrupted. Um, productivity can be decreased. And we can fail in completing our projects in high-level absent um, absenteeism, uh, turnover rate, um, even work termination, right? And these could happen um, in the workplace due to a high level of conflict between work and life. And there are also benefits, you know, on the opposite side, right? The, ben the benefits of work-life balance. So um, for instance, I think, as we all know, uh, the productivity issue, right? Increase the productivity of employees in the workplace, and we also care about, I think, productivity in our personal life because, you know, a lot of us have our, um, you know, uh, personal life um, and we volunteer for nonprofit organizations, for instance, right? So productivity in and outside of the work um, is important to us. Um, and um, less chances of terminating our work um, and less instances of absenteeism and, um fewer chances of feeling sick and ill, like uh, not mentally uh, healthy. Um, and uh, we all want to have a, I think employers all want to have a happy workforce, right? And nobody wants to be stressed out, right? And that's very bad for employees and their employers. Um, and we all want to feel very respected and valued. Um, and, um, you know, both our personal and um career life um, is important. Um, and like improvements in employee mental health and well-being for sure, right? Because we all, as I just said, everyone wants to be happy and we work to support our families, but we want to have good health and our uh, well-being is a very important and critical factor for, for all of us to take care of. Um, and you know, we always in PR, we always talk about employee engagement, right? So that's absolutely a um, good benefit of maintaining a uh, work life balance for employees um, and also for employers. Yes. So, and based on your work and observation, um, what are some of the best foundational practices to encourage employees' work life balance? Mm -hmm. I think the importance of work-life um, balance has been more pronounced since the onset of the pandemic. Um, and I think we have had a lot of discussions on that. I mean, yes, we we talked a lot about that before pandemic. I'm just saying uh, we realize, realize that it's even more important now, right? Because of that experience, the pandemic related experiences. Um, so I think, you know, very often we talk about like, for instance, flexible uh, work schedules, right, and uh, remote working, um, different uh, work modules, and maybe hybrid, uh, you know, that means um, we could have a, a very flexible way of uh, making the arrangements, and for certain days, we work in person, other days, we can work from home, and things like that, um, and I think um, it's also very important um, to make sure leaders and managers know it is important to focus on uh, productivity, efficiency, rather than 
counting the number of hours people spend in their office, right, and um, things like that. Um, and uh, we, we also need to encourage employees take breaks, you know, vacations, right, because they need to get recharged and re-energized um, from time to time. Um, and uh, I think it's a good practice for managers to review their um, subordinates or their employees' workloads, right? And has the workload been reasonable? Has been, sorry, has the workload been manageable, right? And so do employees have their needs? And do you welcome an opportunity to discuss um, their concerns and needs? And I also feel like, you know, um, Again, I think I mentioned this earlier in this interview, they they have their personal life, right? And they have their family. They also have their social life, right? And a lot of employees may want to get involved with certain nonprofit organizations. So we have to give them time and opportunity to volunteer, to uh, be engaged in their social life, personal life, um, and um, think about time off policies of the organizations. Um, you know, it's, it's just... Um, a lot of thinking that should have been um, happening. I, I think, you know, it, it is happening. And uh, we, we can certainly do more um, to increase support for our uh, employees. Yes, that's a great answer. And um, I'm glad you mentioned remote working because we will get back to that later. And I think you already touched some of those factors that can really encourage employees' work-life balance, right? Mm -hmm. So what are some of the other like factors, uh, organizational factors, family factor, or leadership factor that may facilitate versus inhibit such work-life balance? Mm -hmm. I think um, to me, it's all about the culture of an organization. Um, it's a, all about the specific policies that influence employees' work-life balance. Um, as I just mentioned, for instance, flexible work arrangements, on-site childcare, on-site genes, right? And other supportive policies for, for instance, uh, LGBTIQA plus community, um, the leave policies of an organization. And again, we can have many um, examples out there so it's it's all about the establishment and implementation of the policies. Um, and I also think um, the evaluation of the implementation is important too. Employees wouldn't want to feel that they they may be disadvantaged or penalized um, because they used more of the program's policies than their peers did, for example, right? So I think there, there are a lot of things to be uh, taken care of. Um, so I think, you know, it's a very important part um, in terms of the support we can get from organizations. And um, to prepare for the interview, I actually did some uh, research, you know, and because I wanted to, when I talk about supportive programs, um, you know, initiatives that organizations can do, and I want to find some good examples from industry. I think I'm going to share just two examples, quick examples here. Um, so based on my own research um, and Capital One, for instance, um, they have their um, campuses and Capital One's campuses offer uh, fitness facilities and they have their cafes for employees at certain locations. Um, they even have on-site health services for employees and even their families um, in their benefits package is very good, you know, according to the employees. Um, and the packages um, provide flexibility for employees to um, decide on their path to career success and to uh, take care of their health um, and what kind of life support they would like to have and things like that. Um, and similarly, uh, Chick-fil-A um, is another brand that was mentioned in an article that I uh, just researched. Um, and they also have a very good supportive culture, um, you know, to help employees with their work-life balance. Um, so for instance, um, their staffers can um, work in a, a hybrid work environment, and they also receive benefits, packages that include, for instance, uh, fully paid healthcare premiums, um, some wellness benefits, uh, that actually go beyond, um, you know, having on-site genes uh, to work out. Uh, they have access to personalized coaching. Uh, they also have on-site child care, for instance. So I think these are all very um, important 
these are all uh, good examples uh, to tell all of us employees, employers, uh, the importance of having support in place for our employees um, because, you know, work-life balance cannot happen, right, without efforts from uh, both parties, from employees, from their employers. So I think I just talked about um, the support from organizations part. Um, and of course, we can get a lot of support from our family, right? And um, for instance, um, support from our spouses, our partners, um, parents, even our children, right? Uh, all the family members, friends, neighbors. And for me as a mom, I, I made a lot of good friends in the neighborhood and moms uh, in my neighborhood are huge support to me. Um, so I think, you know, um, the support you get from family and support from your personal life, you know, those are all very important. I mean, those sources of important uh, support are all very important. They can be tremendously um, beneficial to you, uh, to our employees. And of course, in terms of leadership, for sure. And I think our leaders um, should lead by example, right? And um, if you want to promote work balance in your organization, and you need to champion that vision, right? And you need to make a good plan and engage employees in scheduling a lot of things and uh, making those programs and initiatives happen, right? Connectively. Uh, and I think, you know, uh, they take major responsibilities for establishing and um, implementing supportive policies to promote employees' well-being and their work-life balance. Yes. So, and as you mentioned before, since the pandemic, uh, organizations start to incorporate remote or hybrid working as mm -hmm. an alternative work module. So, um, mm -hmm. and you touched a little bit about the impact on employee work-life balance. Can you kind of talk more about how this remote working trend going to impact employees' work-life balance or conflict? Yes, for sure. Um Mm, I think theoretically, um, we would agree that remote work, remote working um, as an alternative module would benefit employees' work-life balance policy-wise. Uh, but it should be done in a collaborative way with employees. Uh, we will have to make sure the alternative schedules would work for their interests, not against their interests, right? And um, how to set up those, for instance, flexible schedules to what extent employees can negotiate, right? And also, it, if, if not done appropriately, it can hurt employees' balance as the boundary can be encroached, right? And, and you know, if they are expected to be online nonstop, I don't think, um, you know, remote working would benefit employees' work-life balance, right? So we have to set up the boundaries, make a good schedule, and make sure um, it's a reasonable one for everyone. Um, and then for employees, they can maintain a good balance between work and life. For employers, um, work can be done in a, a great way and work can be done in an efficient way, right? And everyone can be productive while working from home. So I think that's the ultimate goal um, for, for everyone. You know, have a good balance, get the work done e efficiently, and you can still work with your uh, colleagues as teams virtually, right? And you can still communicate with your managers effectively um, and things like that. So it's, it's a, I think it's a collaborative effort, you know, uh, it should be done in the right way. So, and among the many amazing works you've published on this topic. So um, I'm interested in the article titled Strategic Social Media Use in PR. Mm -hmm. Professionals perceived social media impact, leadership behaviors, and work-life balance, mm -hmm. uh, work-life conflict. So, mm -hmm. to give our viewers some background, so this study of yours examined how strategic communicators view the impact of social media use on their work, leadership behaviors, and work-life balance. So, could you please talk a little bit more about this study? Particularly, what you have found, especially regarding the impact of social media use on um, PR professionals' work-life conflict. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, thank you, Wei Ting. Um, and I'm very honored that you feel um, this study um, is worth sharing with other people. Um, and uh, and I also want to 
take um, this opportunity to appreciate the support from the Planck Center for Leadership in Public Relations because my co-authors and I got this done with the funding from the Planck Center. Um, yes, at that time, we were very interested in um, the connections between work-life balance and, you know, um, leadership uh, behaviors of employees, um, uh, supervisors, and also uh to what extent they have been involved in using social media tools in strategic communications and and also how social media use how social media has been used um, in strategic communication functions of the organizations. Um, so as a team, we examined uh, the following key concepts. So I did pull out the data <laughs> from our published uh, article here. So we examined uh, the following key concepts. Um, the first one is the use of social media tools in strategic communications. And we specifically asked our participants about their use of Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube um, in their work. At that time, you know, those were the major uh, social media platforms um, people would use um, in public relations, in strategic com. Um, and we also examined uh, social media using strategic communication functions. So to what extent they used social media in um, some key functions here, for instance, media relations, crisis management, publicity, employee internal communications, um, special events. Uh, community relations, uh, reputation management, you know, and et cetera. Um, and then we also um, ask our survey participants about uh, their perceptions of the impact of social media use upon um, their work, you know, uh, whether um, social media actually, the use of social media has enhanced the role they play in their work, right? And whether social media use has improved their abilities for job responsibilities, improved productivity, allowed flexibility in the hours, practitioners work, improved practitioners' ability to share their ideas with coworkers, and improved um, professional relationships they desired to establish. Um, and uh, the other side, right, that's the positive side. The negative side is we also ask them whether the use of social media has actually increased the demands that professionals work more hours and, and whether they feel like social media use has, um, you know, increased the workload uh, or increased the stress they perceived um, in the workplace. Um, and of course, uh, the key key concepts, the other two key concepts we had in the study um, include work-life conflict, right? Time-based and strain-based. We only examined these two types of work-life conflict, and we also examined their leadership behaviors. Um, so that's a classic definition of uh, leadership in PR. Um, the key dimensions uh, include self-dynamics, team collaboration, ethical orientation, relationship building, strategic decision-making, and communication knowledge management. So um, based on our, um, based on the data we collected from the survey, and very fortunately, I think we, um, you know, uncovered uh, significant relationships among the variables we proposed in the model. You know, the one I just described it to the audience here, um, so we found a significant um, relationships between the use of uh, three key social media platforms here, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and uh, the use of social media in several key functions uh, of public relations, including employee internal communications, cause-related marketing, social marketing, media relations, crisis management, environmental scanning, public affairs, and governmental relations. So all these are related to both um, enhancing impact of social media and the aggre um, aggravating uh, impact of social media use means on one hand, they have enhanced um, the role public relations practitioners play. On the other hand, um, the use of social media did bring um, you know a high level of stress to many public relations professionals. So as um, you know, a double edged sword here, um, and you know, and, and also the enhancing impact of social media use and aggra um, aggravating impact of social media use both uh, were related to professionals' leadership behaviors. So to what extent that would influence the way they they could potentially perform leadership behaviors in their role.
And um, we also found uh, significant relationships between the aggravating impact of social media use and time-based and stream-based work-life conflict. So that means because <clears throat> the use of social media and the use of social media in those key functions of public relations, um, um, now public relations professionals perceived a certain high level of work-life conflict and, and, and uh, strain-based work, um, time-based work-life conflict and strain-based work-life conflict. So I think it's a very interesting study uh, and I totally enjoyed conducting uh, the research. Um, you know, we tried to identify the relationships among the use of social media, the impact of that, professionals' leadership behaviors and their perceived work-life balance, work-life conflict. Yeah, I think it has a great implication, especially given how popular social media is nowadays in professionals' life, right? So, mm -hmm. and um, overall, so what are sort of the advice you can give to employees and their employers to cultivate work-life balance? I think I've talked a lot, right? Yes. yes. Did I? <laughs> yes. I think the last piece of advice I would, uh, would like to share with everybody is um, work together mm -hmm. and care about each other. When I say each other, I'm talking about employees and employers. So I think we should work together to accomplish a good, a, a very good, you know, work-life balance uh, level for our employees. And this cannot happen without support from the employers. And this cannot be done solely by our employees. So I think, you know, this is a collaborative process. Mm -hmm. And of course, as I just said, employees can get a lot of support from their families and uh, personal life. But you know, employers play a very significant role there, as we all know, right? Yes, yes. that's wonderful. Well, so thank you so much. It was such a great pleasure chatting with you and learning from you. This is an extremely great learning process for me and, of course, for the viewers, too. Mm -hmm. So um, this is the end of this episode of In the Workplace, and please tune in for our next episode.